today we're going to try and demystify suspension setup. Now we're going to take advantage of this beautiful sunny day. That is the Gatesgarth Pass right behind us here in the English Lake District and this is a brand new set of RockShox Pike Ultimates that you probably saw in the last video. And this is a great opportunity to play around with some of the settings and we thought while we're doing that let's get the camera out and bring you guys along for the journey. Now on the ride up here I had a really good chance to think about how I want this video to pan out and we split it down into chapters for you below. But we're going to start off back in the workshop with a bit of anatomy. Totally arrived. Very quick anatomy lesson coming up and I've also taken apart a few bits of old suspension forks because I really want to show you what all these knobs and dials are actually doing inside because I really believe that if you can visualize what it is that you're actually changing, your understanding of what you're doing becomes so much clearer. So very quickly, this black section you can see here is what we call the lowers or the castings. This is what it will look like if you were to remove them. And these little bits here are called the wiper seals and inside here will be a whole load of things like this, little white foam rings which hold onto the lubricant. So when you talk about having your suspension serviced, you might hear the word lower leg service. And all that means is we're dropping these lower legs, replacing these wiper seals, meticulously cleaning, checking the bushings, and then adding more lubricant and filling up those foam rings with fresh lubricant. The uppers then, this generic term, for all the other pieces you can see from this gold sections here, which we call the stanchions, the crown, and the steerer tube, and all the internals there are going to make up the uppers. Now, this is what they look like close up. And these surfaces, you want to make sure that they are perfectly clean and slippery. They are designed to be silky smooth and slippery. Now, in the left-hand side or non-drive side is the air side. Normally, there are some coil sprung forks out there, tend to be on the cheaper models or the most expensive models, and they've got different advantages to them. But I'm presuming that most of you have an air sprung fork, which you're going to fill up with a shock pump. Now, in here, it works exactly like a syringe. So I've got a little syringe here just to show you. And if I was to put my thumb over the end and use my finger as a rock hitting my front wheel, that the harder I press here, the more back pressure I feel. And that is because as volume halves, pressure doubles. And with that equation, we get that ramp rate in the spring, which means that I need to press harder and harder and harder to compress that air at the top. And when I do, the spring becomes that much more reactive. So at the bottom of the stroke, imagine those first few centimeters of travel, it's very easy. It doesn't take much of a hit to do that. But as you get further and further up, it takes a bigger and bigger impact to compress that air, which is why we then talk about volume reducers. And if you've ever brought a bike or a set of forks, you've probably seen things like this that come in the box. And these unscrew and these go into this air chamber here. Now what that does is reduce the amount of volume of air in there, even though you're running the same pressure, which means that, in fact, if I can set this up with a little red nut, pop this into the syringe first, set it to the same depth, you can now imagine that my volume of air in there has now decreased. So as I pretend to compress on this, the air pressure in there is gonna build up faster because the volume has been reduced, which is what we're doing with those volume spaces. Now, depending on the fork, you might have no spaces in there, one, two, maybe even four spaces in there, and this is something that you can fine tune. Hopefully you're still with me. Let's get onto the damper side. The damper is here to give some sort of control over that spring, and we're gonna have two adjustments here, the compression damper and the rebound damper. That compression damper is there to control the spring as you've hit something with your front wheel and you're now compressing the fork and you don't want to just compress that spring in its entirety straight away. The rebound damper is therefore to stop that spring returning like a big powerful out of control object but to give some control over it but also to allow the fork to extend when it has the opportunity to do so which is when you've relieved some of the pressure off the handlebars or the obstacle underneath its front wheel has been removed. Remember, always trying to keep traction with your front wheel, so you want the fork to drop into the trail as much as you want it to move out of the way of any rocks as well. Now, as you can imagine, dampers come in all shapes and sizes, and at very, very simplest level, you can imagine this gold stanchion here completely filled with oil, and there's literally 
a shaft with a piston on the end like this, driving up and down through that oil. And this is just being metered by a hole in the middle, allowing oil to pass and come out through a little ejection valve or through a little series of shims that just bend out of the way as the velocity of that oil buildup is enough to bend that metal out of the way, which is how we get our control. Now, this is actually all metered with this uh, rebound knob at the bottom, and your rebound knob is literally just gonna be turning a, a shaft that adjusts the valve up here. Let me show you. Here is a slightly more up-to-date version. This is now a one big cartridge, and that will sit in this entire leg. And when we take it out for service, it would come out like this. Now, inside this is now the oil, and this is your plunger moving up and down inside that volume of oil. If I remove this, you can see that these often come with much more intricate pistons with so many more valves and shims in there to control it. But they all still work on the same idea that here is that little metering rod with, at the end there, you can just see a very foot, a sort of needle end. And that needle end is going to adjust the size of the aperture inside this shaft here. And as oil is trying to become through this hole here and be ejected through here, that's what we are controlling. So when we're adjusting that rebound, we're just adjusting the size of this aperture to control how quickly the fork will return to its travel. So on slightly more advanced dampers where you have more than just a lockout, an on off switch essentially, you will have something that looks a bit more like this. Now, this now has like a flexible bladder at the top here, and that's gonna help provide some sort of back pressure to the volume of oil in there. But also inside this, and I won't go into it too much, is very similar to what you saw in that rebound, lots of valves and shim stacks that are all going to be controlling one, the high speed compression, which is when we have high shaft speed, which is when we've taken a big hit on the bottom, or low shaft speed, when we've got a slow gradual drop off, for example. And we can adjust those two things independently. However, there is usually a little bit of crosstalk between the two because things aren't ever as that binary in mountain biking as either hard or fast. There's always some gray area in the middle. So for the rest of this video, we are gonna get over to the classroom and I want to try and explain to you the relationship between air pressure, compression, and rebound. So that when you're out on the trail and you want to make an adjustment to one of those, you also understand what influence that is gonna have on another part of the fork. Okay, wish me luck. To help with the rest of the video when we go outside and actually make these adjustments, I put together this little matrix that kind of explains what it is that we're trying to do. Now, this is the relationship between air, rebound, and compression. Now, where that balance sit for you might be different from someone else, but what we're trying to do as riders is to identify those points where we feel we're most in tune with our suspension. However, there are a few rules to follow, and that is that if you think you are not using the full amount of your travel and you want to reduce some of your air, i.e. take some air out, you also need to compensate by slowing down your compression damping so that you don't sink through all of your travel too quickly. On the other side, if you feel like your fork isn't returning after a big hit and you want to add some air, then you're going to try and get that much more lively spring that you've created back under control by slowing down the rebound. Quick sidebar, because you're going to want to establish some kind of starting point for your air spring. The easiest way to do this is outside on the bike. Take a ruler and a shock pump with you. You're going to make sure you want your rebound and your compression both at their fastest point, so your spring is at its springiest, if you like. And then, on your bike, cycle the fork a couple of times to equalize the air, slide down the marker, establish your normal riding position, come to a stop, and take a look at where that marker is. This should be between 10 and 30% of the travel. This is a little bit on the high side, so let's add some air. Having said that, you'll normally find that the manufacturer's recommendations, which are normally written on the side of the fork, are normally pretty good. And we're just fine tuning that a little bit. If you find yourself going outside those recommendations, or if you're running less than 10% sag, and you still find that you're using all of the travel of your fork, then it's time to think about adding some volume spaces. So once we've established our air pressure, giving us that travel that we want and that progressive spring rate, we can then think about the relationship between our rebound and our compression. 
If we have our rebound too fast, you're gonna end up with a fork that feels very, very lively, almost like you're inside a pinball machine and you're trying to control this thing that's really out of control, not what you want. On the other side, if your compression is too slow, it's gonna feel like you've got a very soggy fork, like it's just sunk into the bottom of its travel and it's not really giving you the support that you want to when you actually need it. So that's the real key in the suspension tuning is to try and get this relationship between too lively and too soggy once we've established our air. Right, let's head outside and show you what I mean. Here we go. Now that last descent off the Gatesgarth Pass was absolutely awesome, but it's made up of lots of boulders about the size of my fist, and it was quite fast, but I shouldn't have really used as much travel as I did on that descent. Um, when I did use that travel, it was through a big compression as I went through a river, but even still, I shouldn't have used all of my travel on something like that because I want to just hold some in reserve for me riding steeper, more rocky sections like this, which we're about to do. So I'm gonna add a little bit more air into here to stop me going through the travel quite so quickly. And because that spring is now gonna become a little bit more reactive, I'm gonna slow that down by slowing down some of the rebound. much better but I'm just going to slow down the compression damping a little bit to give myself a little bit more support as I take on some of the drops. Last descent of the day, pretty sure I'm there with my suspension setup now. I'm happy with my air spring, I'm going through the majority but not all of my travel. The rebound feels great, I feel like after I've taken a big hit, I know the fork's gonna be there for me on the next big hit. On this descent here, I know it's particularly rocky and there's a few rollable drop-offs. And those rocks come at you quite fast and they deflect the front wheel. So I'm gonna open up the high-speed compression so those big hits don't come up back up through me. And I'm gonna dial back the low-speed compression a bit. So when I do those low-speed roll-offs, I know that I've got the support of the fork and it's not gonna dive through its travel completely in one go. Let's give it a go. Now I think that's probably it for now, but of course I'll probably continue to go on and adjust these suspension forks for as long as I own them as part of being a mountain biker in constant pursuit of the perfect setup. Now there's a couple of things I haven't mentioned in the video that you might be confused about, and that is probably how different brands might name their compression damping. For instance, on a Fox fork, you might see it labeled as CTD for climb, trail and descend. Other brands might call it things like firmness. They're essentially all the same thing and the manual that came with your fork will tell you what that all translates to. So that just leaves me to say, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, what are you still doing? Watch it, but if you insist, please give it a thumbs down. Please subscribe if you want to see more content from us like this in the future, alongside some of our more fitness orientated content. And of course, let us know how you got on with your own suspension setup in the comments. We really do reply to and love reading every single one of them. Okay, good luck out there.